When everything changes, nothing changes. A simple, direct phrase. This phrase is directly responsible for every event in this game. Without this phrase, there's no camarada, no process, no transistor. Both the tool and the game, by the by. It's a phrase the game holds dear, repeating it again and again and again. Perhaps we should look at why, but it's been a while, yes? Perhaps too long, I suppose. Well, either way, let's take a second and establish a bit of context, a bit of backstory. May benefit everyone. Well, let's get to it then. There are games that are cryptic, and then there's Transistor. To say the game doesn't provide clear answers is to sell it short. Transistor lives off of vaguely worded, half-remembered implications. This is not a game with many clear answers, nor is it one that's keen to try and provide the ones it does have. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't answers to be had. Although, as I said, it's been a while. So let's take a minute and talk about what we know happened over the course of the game. But this game is such that even saying we're going to talk about what we know comes with some qualifiers. We're going to start off talking about things that, as far as I'm concerned, are indisputably canon, even if they're actually fairly disputable. If this were math, then this initial summary is my postulates. It's not all necessarily true, but we're going to need to use this as a base if we're going to get anywhere with this. From there, we'll look at stuff that's a bit more debatable. Sound good? All right then, so. There was once a civil servant, an administrator. This man had worked tirelessly for longer than nearly anyone else to ensure that the people of his city were taken care of, heard, and most importantly, properly represented. For years, he diligently saw to it that every voice in Cloudbank was heard, to the extent that by the time we meet him, he has taken every political stance one could take at one point or another. In all this time, he would always advocate for the majority opinion. Not out of any cynical desire for political advantage, since his position was actually quite secure, but instead in the name of representing the will of his constituents. He was a man who was so dedicated to his people's voice that he let his own voice be silenced. Their will came first, his came second. And for years, that was enough for him. That is, until it wasn't. As time crept by, he felt his own voice yearning to be heard, his own stances, his own goals. He was able to keep it under the surface, at least until one day a friend gave him something. You see, this friend, genius that he was, made the city take whatever shape the people asked of it. Somehow or another, maybe he found it, maybe the reverse, he'd acquired the means to rebuild the city in an instant. It was a tool, or rather, a tool that provided tools that they needed to shape the horizon to their will. By means of a specialized process, the civil servant saw his chance. But they both knew what they had wasn't enough. So they began, joined shortly by a journalist who hid what they did, and a socialite who told them where to find whoever was needed, each bound by a shared creed. Soon, people began to vanish. Not all at once, but not entirely by coincidence either. Strangely, those who disappeared always seemed to be people with remarkable talents. A detective, an athlete, a designer, an entertainer, a politician. People with success, however also people who were on their way out, as it were. People who, despite their success, were preparing to fade from the public eye, be it due to choice or circumstance. As such, it never aroused much suspicion. After all, opting to get out of the city and spend some quiet time in the country isn't so strange, is it? 
especially when life isn't going your way. Everything was carrying on as it was meant to. Just under the surface, however, things weren't so clean. The socialite, being the person she was, had her own plans. There was a musician. A musician with one of the most powerful voices in the city. And the socialite dreamt of her, eager to be close. Of course it wasn't that simple. A man stood in her way. Not an exceptional man. Not a man that was better than her. Simply a man. She could not accept this. Thankfully, she had a position. A position of power. A position that would give her a chance to be rid of that man. She told them that the musician should be next. And they listened. She said that she knew when they'd be alone. They agreed. She had lied. When they arrived, they acted without pause. But that man was there, and he too acted without pause. The blade found a new target. It made its home and carried him through the glass behind him. The musician followed quickly behind, and so they both fell into the river below. The current carried them to the edge of town. She dragged the man's body ashore, that thing still lodged in his chest. The man's voice rang, but not from his mouth, but from the blade. Hey, Red. We're not gonna get away with this, are we? They hadn't seen fit to simply take him from her. Instead, they had decided to reshape him into this. And when she goes to curse them, the musician finds that that's not all they did. Her voice had left, pulled, inside the transistor. Of all the things to take, this would not stand. She rips the blade from his chest and carries it, focused on revenge. But this blade isn't just a weapon, is it? It's a tool, or rather a tool that controls tools. And now it's being controlled by someone who doesn't know how to control it. What happens next is natural. The process it controls goes rampant, seeking by any means necessary to reset the world to what it views as its default state. This ultimately doesn't matter much, though. They stand in opposition, no question, but one by one they fall to the side, each one bringing the couple that much closer to those that had pulled them away from each other. They find the socialite first, consumed by the process yet still mad with passion for the musician. She was already gone by the time they got there. The pair just did what needed to be done. The socialite gives them what they need, the location of the servant and the journalist. The pair climb to meet him, however, the spine shivers up the tower, forcing the man away in any meaningful sense. Nonetheless, a tool can't kill its user. There, they found them both. It should come as no surprise that the two were together. The two were always together, after all. So they joined the rest. And now, for better or for ill, only one remains. By now, the tool and its minions had consumed the city. Some existed on the outskirts, but it was only a fraction of what the city used to hold. Maybe it was stubbornness, but who really knows. The pair find the last of them, but he's not here for a fight, but rather to explain. And he does explain. And he explains, and he explains, and he explains. And it does help, but not as much as one might hope. It didn't ultimately matter, though, did it? Because no matter the means, no matter the excuse, no matter the justification, Red found her way to the cradle, and, however reluctantly, took her revenge. With the score finally settled, the musician began to rebuild the city. But as she built, she found herself making statues of a man and woman being brought together. All she could truly find herself caring about was the loss of that man. This wasn't enough. It would never be enough. Again, what happened next was natural. The man's body rested nearby, though in its own form. And, well, so it goes. Red. Most people upon finishing Transistor for the first time are left with this lingering sense of unease. This sense of unease is usually made manifest within the oft-posited question, what the hell did I just play? The game really goes off the rails by the end, and the story as a whole can be hard to parse due to its inherently vague nature. But it is doable. So, let's start with a simple question. What is Cloudbank? Well, it's a city. 
a city where everything seems oddly utopic before the Camerata released the process. It's a place that constantly changes in an instant to suit the whims of its citizens, and the majority of those citizens seem to be earnestly happy. New buildings rise and fall in a moment, parks turn to art galleries overnight, as the horizon is shaped by public opinion. With one notable exception, everyone we meet is wildly successful in their chosen field. No one here is too young, nor are they too old. Of those we see, the youngest is 22, while the oldest is only 55. Admittedly though, we don't meet too many people. For some reason, in a city that is supposed to be in the midst of an evacuation of at least 100,000 of its citizens, we only ever see a single living person. Hell, we don't even see that many dead ones. For being a crisis that sweeps over the entire city and supposedly decimates its massive population, we only ever see three victims of the process. It's worth noting, by the way, that two of these random victims were just as wildly successful as the people that the Camerata sought out. And the third is a member of the Camerata itself. Money and even physical labor is nothing but a memory. It doesn't matter when you order food because no one's there to make or deliver it. Near as we can tell, food simply appears. As such, it's freely available upon request. Same thing with anything in this city, ranging from a skyscraper to the color of the sky. This is a city that is fully automated. Most of all, it's a city ruled completely by democracy. Everything down to the weather is up for vote. In fact, your voice is highly valued. People will come to your door to encourage you to fulfill your civic duty if you've been neglecting it, while others make sure that whatever it is you choose is enacted swiftly and completely. If the populace decides it wants a new bridge, it gets a new bridge. That's just the way things are. Nothing truly happens in this town without the say-so of the people. What's especially interesting, though, is that it's also a city that keeps exact stats on how every single citizen spends their time. After all, how else would they know that Neola was spending 66% of her time on civic duty? Or that exactly 56% of Cloudbank had worn Maximilius' fashion, despite popular belief to the contrary? So, with that in mind, here's what I want to ask you. How can a city acquire the seemingly infinite resources to somehow be able to take the public's vote in a snap and instantly act on those votes by way of a process controlled by a transistor? From this angle, it's obvious. Cloudbank isn't a city. It's a server. There's no shortage of people who would say that Cloudbank is a wholly virtual world, something akin to Tron or Reboot. And while that's a reading I can appreciate, it's one that I have to disagree with. Rather, I think what we have here is much more comparable to a post-singularity world, with actual people connected to a shared digital paradise that they have complete control over. The biggest piece of evidence for this is the country, the realm where people go when they leave. I said leave there for an express purpose. Death is not a thing in Cloudbank. No one dies. People retire, they vacation, but they don't die. Hell, even those who die don't really die. We come across bodies, but who they are remains. And we pull their very beans into our digital blade to quite literally use as a new function. And this is to say nothing of how people talk about the country. If you retire, you go to the country. If you vacation, you go to the country. If you commit suicide by hemlock, you go to the country. So what is the country? Initially, it's the real world. It's somewhere that someone has to have the ability to visit without going away permanently in the strict sense of things. Again, you need to be able to go on vacation there. It also needs to be such that you have to have the implied ability to return. But there wouldn't be anyone in Cloudbank who ever knew you, to the extent that you might as well have not existed. Almost like time passes more slowly there than in the city. However, as the game goes on, it is increasingly used to describe what's going on inside the transistor. Well, kinda. We're going to put a pin in that for a minute, but try to keep it in mind. Being in the country isn't considered simply being away from Cloudbank, but separate from it. People throw farewell parties for those headed there. It's never talked about mournfully, but it is talked about with finality. It may not be the end of these people's story, but it is the end of this chapter. Likewise, no one questions if the country is real. They know it's just as real as Cloudbank itself. Now, once you factor in that in a post-singularity world, real-life cities would most likely become a thing of the past, things start to fall into place. After all, why create a place that devours resources, causes massive pollution, and requires perpetual maintenance to prevent causing harm to its denizens, when you could make a superior version of that place with a fraction of the materials and none of the downsides? And without cities, what do you have? 
Calling it the country makes an obvious kind of sense when you think about it. Just so we're clear though, this isn't the only evidence for Cloudbank's true nature. There's a lot of things we could point to. I mean, yes, there's everything involving the transistor and its place in the world, but that's only one part. There's the fact that the town's name is Cloudbank. Almost like it's a cloud computing server bank. Or that areas that are cut off from public access are referred to as offline pending investigation. Or the fact that the transistor is merely one part of a larger cradle, the thing controlling Cloudbank's very existence. And there's the fact that Sybil's voice becomes more digitized as she's consumed by the process. And let's not forget that that's the same process that controls the shape of the entire city. The same process that is named after and acts just like a standard computer process and treats everything as though it were rewritable code. And this brings us to our next question. What is the process? Well, if you know computers at all, it's fairly self-explanatory. Just like in real life, the process, or rather, processes at large, are controlled by the transistors. However, in order to control the process, you need to know how to use the transistor. Without the transistor being controlled by the proper user, though, the process does what it's set to do by default. Dump memory it thinks isn't being used, and wait for the next user command. It's worth remembering here that this wasn't the intended plan. As misguided as the Camerata were, their plan wasn't to simply unleash the process on the city to tear it apart. In fact, it's debatable what the Camerata's plan even was. And here is where we're going to get deep into speculation territory. The game really goes out of its way to ensure that the Camerata's plan is as obfuscated as possible. So a lot of this is me pulling from implication, background details, and the fragments of truth we are given. That being said, here's what I'm seeing. The Camerata were tired of the state of constant change that Cloudbank found itself in. They make this clear. When everything changes, nothing changes. By its nature, Cloudbank lacks a true history. But history isn't just what happened. It's evidence of what happened. And when every sidewalk is forever freshly paved, when every building is whatever's in vogue, and when every face is new, how can history hope to take root? They were people who sought to serve their city, but what was there to serve? There was no town to speak of, just a writhing mass of architecture that changed at the public's fickle whim. Worse than that, they found it ran in circles. Parks gave way to railways that gave way to bridges that gave way to parks. They weren't even destroying the city for the sake of making something better, simply something different. The Camerata did nothing if not love Cloudbank. At least as far as Grant, Asher, and Royce are concerned, their passion for protecting Cloudbank was genuine. They wanted what was best for their city and its people, which in their eyes meant creating a cloud bank that could finally change in a meaningful way. To that end, they aimed to use the transistor to build a new city, one that would only change as needed, not as wanted, all while using the people pulled into the transistor as their founding population, all of whom, I remind you, were people who were on the cusp of leaving for the country anyways. As we see, the Cradle has the ability to create a world that looks very much like what is obviously the country. Who knows, maybe the inside of both the Cradle and the Transistor look like the country by default all the time. What we do know is that Grant and Royce were both tired of Cloudbank's unchanging nature, but they weren't ready to leave it for the country either. As such, the next best thing in their eyes may have been to bring Cloudbank to the country, a place where it would finally be forced to remain static, and as a result, finally start to grow in earnest. But all of this doesn't matter much in the grand scheme of things. This plan never came close to fruition, and spending too much time obsessing over it is kind of missing the point. The game essentially tells us this when we find Grant and Asher, where you find the Camerata's entire grand plan, yet never hear it. Red knows what their plan was, but the player doesn't, because they don't need to. That same prompt also lets us know that their plan was only about 14% complete. They hadn't even started before things went to hell. In storytelling, time is currency. And how the story allocates its time can tell us a great deal about what the story thinks is important. Transistor doesn't spend a lot of time looking at what the Camerata did or where the Transistor came from or any other minute story details it leaves ambiguous. Those are secondary concerns at best. So, what does the game spend time doing? Well, it uses its time to ask you to make your voice heard in polls, and to explain why the Camerata did what they did, and to have you fight back against the process. Most of all, it has you spend time with Red and her partner. So if that's what the game wants to talk about, then I guess we should do that. Cloudbank is a city of the people. Its citizens quite literally decide what every day will look like. 
every aspect of the city is up for vote. All that stands between an individual and a sky of their own design shining above them for all to see is 50% of the votes plus one. On the surface, this seems pretty fair, right? I mean, what's more fair than majority rules? Let's talk about that. Early on in Transistor, we come to a terminal that's holding a vote for the weather for the day. The man in the Transistor, who for simplicity's sake we'll call Boxer, expresses some hope that maybe we can get some rain to help cover our escape. The menu boots, and he is dismayed to find that rain isn't even on the ballot. This is the first problem with democracy in Cloudbank. Your vote is only as good as the options provided to you. In this moment, Red and Boxer have a very real need. They are presumably being hunted by a powerful organization that near as they can tell, wants their lives. However, of all of the potential choices that could possibly help them, none are even offered. And even if they were, they would still need over 50% of Cloudbank to vote in agreement with them in order to get it. This small moment lies at the heart of how Cloudbank fails to truly hear the voices of its people. Democracy is only as good as its choices. And while Cloudbank may offer a lot of surface level choice, it seems to lack much choice in the absolute sense. A good example of this is Neola Chen. We know her as one of the traces within the transistor, but prior to that, she lived as a community organizer of sorts. Neola spent 66% of her time, and I quote, passing ordinances to improve underdeveloped regions, reaching out to and educating habitual non-voters, or advocating for groups lacking adequate representation. 66% of her time. That would be 16 hours a day, which translates into her spending essentially every waking moment on what is, in essence, social outreach for people the city has left behind in one way or another. Based on this, it would be reasonable to assume that Cloudbank isn't quite as utopian as it may first seem. Political disenfranchisement is a legitimate problem for its citizens. To make matters worse, it doesn't seem to have been done out of public ignorance, but rather systemic elitism. Neola, like everyone else in the Transistor, was at a low point in her life before the Camerata found her. Being the advocate she was, Neola had campaigned to convert part of the city to a gallery space for people pursuing unusual or experimental crafts that were traditionally disregarded by people in the city. For this act, Neola, and again I quote, found herself accused of stirring unrest by calling attention to meritless perspectives of undeserving notice. This backlash was so strong that she publicly lost her composure in an event that would have escalated if the Camerata themselves hadn't stepped in. All of this would eventually culminate with Neola agreeing to work with the Camerata, and before long, she was inside the transistor. Let that sink in though. Neola found herself on the receiving end of a hate mob so large and potent that she had to align herself with the Camerata for her protection all for the crime of defending and amplifying minority viewpoints. I mean, what good is a suburb when the town has got it all? Cloudbank is a city that loves change, but despises changing. It loves crafting the skyline to match the culture, but refuses to change the culture to improve the skyline for all. Even those with affluence, with genuine political pull like all of those within the transistor, lack the power to make any real difference. Every member of the Camerata has a colossal platform, but even they aren't able to truly make a difference on their own. As Asher puts it, What good could four individuals ever hope to accomplish in this city with only their own four voices? The city is too big for any one of them. No one individual can make a meaningful difference. And we see this in Neola and Grant. Thing is, Neola isn't all that different from Grant. They're both civil servants that have dedicated their whole lives to Cloudbank and her people, always seeking to hear their voice and make their will into reality. The only true difference is that while Neola advocated for social justice, Grant is a populist, always taking whatever the majority view was to ensure the people's voice was properly heard. Again, let's not forget that Grant is such a populist that at one time or another he has found himself both defending and advocating for basically every social stance a person can possibly have. Problem is that populism, by its very nature, deprives the minority viewpoint from being meaningfully heard, be it the minority opinions that Neola sought to protect, or the opinions of people like Grant himself as an individual who have to sacrifice their own voices as a means to broadcast others. 
Fitting the computer-like nature of the setting, it takes the purest logical standpoint of democracy, looking at the majority rule as the fairest way to appease the populace as a greater whole, but ignores the nuances of those choices and leaves no room for a middle ground or for new perspectives to be allowed. And it's this very failing of Cloudbank's democracy that leads to the creation of the Camerata, and by extension, the fall of the city itself. Majority rule is fantastic, so long as you're part of the majority. Otherwise, your voice will simply not be heard. Now, how might this affect the culture of the world itself? Well, we had a saying which goes when everything changes, nothing changes. You see, when everything changes, nothing changes. But all this. This isn't what we had in mind. In this town, it changes shape all the time, right? Bridges, parks, highways rising and falling. Rising and falling at the people's whim with the changing of the seasons. Even the seasons, they're just whim. My, I guess I grew weary of it. After a while, things changing all the time. All the time. Cloudbank is a city that doesn't really exist. This is true in both the literal sense as well as the canonical sense, but also in the cultural and historical sense as well. It has nothing to truly call its own because everything that ever made a cloud bank has been demolished and built over dozens if not hundreds if not thousands of times. It's the ship of Theseus on a grand scale, and each time it rose with its new shape would come a new culture. The cloud bank we see in the game is cloud bank for the moment, but it will change again. And with that, a new culture, a new cloud bank, will take its place. And it's this that the Camerata wanted to prevent. Asher himself says this in no uncertain terms. We love our city the way it is. We didn't want to see it fade because someone out there didn't like the color of the sky. Everything we did, everything we're doing, is for Cloudbank. Where we live will always define our lives to a sizable degree, one way or another. And Cloudbank is begging us to ask the question, what would happen if the culture of where we live were democratized? And the answer it comes back with is that the culture of such a place would always be changing on a dime to suit the majority. But that also means, by definition, the culture will always be ephemeral, just a temporary distraction before the next thing takes its place. Imagine how often culture changes over decades in the real world, building and expanding on itself until the public fascination with it begins to fade before being inevitably lost to time. And then picture all of that occurring within days of each other. We don't know how many different cloud banks there have been. This is a town that has no history because everything that could denote its history has been painted over a million times. Even the people who experienced it firsthand have a difficult time of giving a thorough account of what happened. Probably because when things change rapidly enough, it becomes almost impossible to keep track of it all. It's information overload. There's just too much happening to learn all of it. And as the saying goes, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. And Cloudbank is that statement made manifest. Recursion is an idea that's close to the heart of Transistor. As I said, parks give way to railways that give way to bridges that give way to parks. Even the New Game Plus is referred to as a recursion, because it is. This is why it opens with Royce's voice coming from the blade. Hey, Red. We're not gonna get away with this, are we? And that's also why you see, well, you on your second playthrough. Over the course of that second play, you'll see this phantom tracing your steps from your original run. The more recursions you have, the more of these after images appear. Just because this is happening again, doesn't mean it didn't happen before. The events of that first run through still took place, even if the effects of it had been paved over. It repeats, and repeats, and repeats. But as we've established, this is nothing new for Cloudbank. This is just the way things are. It's the way things have always been. And it's exactly that that the Camerata took issue with. They loved the city as it existed. They wanted it to thrive and flourish for what it was, not what it was forced to be. So they tried to stop it from changing. But in this world, change cannot be enacted or halted without the right voices. And there will always be someone who fights back. 
especially in a place where everyone's voice can be heard instantaneously. A small handful of people could never control it all, there'd always be a loose end somewhere. Without the proper kind of traction, affecting change is nearly impossible. So the town is fated to be destroyed and rebuilt, again and again, having no history, always shifting in form, but never shifting in meaning. Now let's consider for a moment that where they live is functionally indistinguishable from the internet. A social space inside of a computer where you can make your thoughts and feelings be known at a moment's notice, that shifts its culture and appearance on a whim to suit public opinion. A place that moves faster than someone could ever hope to keep up with. Where the history of the space its denizens inhabit is so often forgotten or even actively destroyed. And so we see the same events playing out again and again. Where what's popular is king, but is ultimately just as fleeting as what came before it and what will come after. Where the democratization of culture has ultimately resulted in that culture becoming disposable. Because nothing, no matter how good, can ever last long enough to have a true impact. It's simply just a series of trends that repeat and cycle. And it can be frustrating to see at times. Things change so fast and so sporadically that it often feels like planning for anything is a hopeless endeavor. How can we be expected to live in a world where everything that's created, every word that's spoken, no matter how valuable, seems fated to get washed away in an ocean of distractions? It can be genuinely exhausting to deal with. So how might one respond to this kind of world, to try to find meaning in it? What kind of person could ever hope to find true contentment in a world of disposable oddities? Thing is, we already know. Boxer is a fascinating character. As our narrator, he's easily the most fleshed out character by far, and the person we spend the most time with. However, he is also the only person we see who isn't wildly successful. What's more, he doesn't even seem to know what he wants to do with his life. One thing that's consistent amongst all of Cloudbank's citizens is all of them have specializations called selections, for which most give a reason for their choice. Neola Chen selects empathy and politics, citing that everyone deserves the best. Grant selects civics and judgment. When asked why, he says, Cloudbank of course, and Red chooses music and linguistics, declining to say why. Then there's Boxer, who has no selections. In fact, his bio explicitly states that 0% of Cloudbank hasn't selected anything, which most likely means that he's the only one. He does give a reason though, specifically that he's still trying to figure things out. Boxer is the only person in all of Cloudbank who doesn't know who they want to be. In a city defined by individuality, by letting everyone have a voice of their own, the character we come to know the best is the one who doesn't know where their passion lies. The only one of his kind. Cloudbank is a town where you can be anything you want. So what does it mean for someone who lives there that doesn't know what they want? He is someone who, near as we can tell prior to the game, exists to fulfill one purpose. To protect Red. And by God, does he do that in spectacular fashion. But this is never what he wanted his life to be. Just like the members of the Camerata, he wasn't built to just serve anyone. He had his own wants and his own desires. However, in spite of all of this, he has found what it is he truly wants by the end of the game. And it's a deceptively basic and human thing. All he wants is to be with Red, no matter what. Everyone always said he could be anything you want in this town. This is it for me. I could get used to this. If you could be whatever your conception of professional success is, would that alone make you happy? Because this is what everyone in the city has, yet a large chunk of the population is discontent and frustrated, most of all the camarada. Oddly though, the two people who have found genuine lasting happiness by the end are the two who had that professional success stripped away from them, or that never had it in the first place. Rather, they find contentment and happiness in the most obvious source possible, each other. What Boxer looks like, his lack of control, his own actual murder, doesn't matter in the face of what it is he still has. In a world where culture is irrelevant, where history is irrelevant, when human life seems to have no value, only one thing truly remains. What you've built with those you love. In a world where nothing really changes, all we have left is people. Not as the ambiguous monolith of Cloudbank that the Camerata tried to see them as, but as individuals. 
real human connections, the kind that give you a reason to wake up in the morning. I want to be clear though, these connections don't have to be romantic. While it's heavily implied that Red and Boxer were an item, it's not necessarily the case. It's more nuanced than that. They clearly had a complete, meaningful relationship together before this game even started. And when you're linked with someone in that kind of way, boiling it down to just being romantic is always going to be reductionist. Boxer's dedication seems to come from an earnest love for who Red is. This is an area where I can't grab specific examples. It's a cumulative effect. The way Boxer talks about Red, the way he hurts for her when she suffers, the way he continues to protect her, no matter what. I mean, you get him drunk, and one of the first things he does is start talking about how much he loves Red. It's beautiful from beginning to end. However, it's not just a one-way street. Red may be a silent protagonist in the strictest sense of the term, but that doesn't mean she's simply a blank slate. Let's not forget that all of this began because Red refused to be close to anyone other than Boxer. They have both sacrificed what they are for the person they love, both literally and figuratively. She even goes out of her way to embrace him after every fight. They deserve each other in the purest sense. This is why Red turns left in the first place, down the path to face the Camerata for what they did. But Red only truly cares about trying to fix the person she loves. Even without her ever saying it, we know that she values him just as highly as he does her. Fact of the matter is though that they've ultimately been separated. Once you leave Cloudbank, there's no coming back. So after everything is said and done, after she's brought everyone who caused him to suffer to the same fate he's suffered, after she has achieved the powers of a god to rebuild the world to her own whim, what does she do? It should go without saying. She goes where Boxer is, of course. Red! Red. We live in a world where finding a true purpose can seem hard, even impossible. So many things seem fleeting these days, but what truly matters is what has always mattered. People. Having your purpose in life be someone that you love is fine. Normal, in fact. I know it's the case for me. Now more than ever, we need each other. When we live in a world that never stops moving, the closest thing we have to an anchor is those we know in reality. And as the internet becomes more and more all-consuming, those grounding points are only going to become more valuable. It might not be all we have left, but I find it hard to say it isn't the most important. There's nothing Transistor cares about more than the human connections we make and how they can make the world beautiful, even when it feels like everything else has been stripped from us. The only way to survive in such a world is to find people and care about them. Even if it hurts, even if it's painful, it'll be worth it. And no matter what you do, don't let go. Hello, my name is Ryan, and I would like to thank you for watching. I know it's been a while since I've made a big video, and I hope it was worth the wait. On that note, I would like to take a second to thank everyone who's currently helping me on Patreon. Because, you know, why not? Figure it's the least I can do. Also, I apologize in advance if I mispronounce anyone's name. So, that being said, huge shout out to Sherry Parr, a very famous person, Sam Natchison, Kevin Thurber, Keith, Black Mage App, Ray Slocumb, Jonathan Quavito, Spiral Power, Foxcade, Ross Lampert, Fish, Matthew Cassidy, The Real James I, Bradley Sanchez, Brian Young, Kevin Murphy, Ryan Moy, hey, you have a good name, Andrew Fromnecht, there's no way I didn't screw that one up, Sky the English Gamer, David, I'm going to spare both of us from having to hear me butcher your name, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Bilton Meum, Mr. Valdez, SJ Mapler, Colin Horgan, Solid Rooster, Lavinia Lucius, and Spec Ops. Thank you guys for everything. Anyways, thank you for watching. I love you all. Peace.